Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar, How to Combat the DDoS Threats We're Seeing in 2017. My name is Helen McInnes and I'm your moderator today. Some of you may not know Orange Business Services. Our cyber defense solutions help enterprises identify and reduce security risks, limit the impact of incidents and ensure regulatory compliance. As a global communication service provider, we're better able to identify emerging DDoS threats, the way in which they spread, and provide the right combination of multi-layered mitigation solutions. I'm very pleased to introduce today's speakers, Darren Anstey, Chief Security Technologist at Arbor Networks, a market leader in DDoS visibility, protection, and advanced threat solutions. Darren has 20 years' experience in, in defending enterprises from threats. We also have Massimiliano Brugnoli from the business development team at Orange Cyber Defense. He's worked in the, this market for a similar length of time and believes multinationals can best defend themselves from cyber attacks using accurate, contextualized, and weaponized adversary intelligence. Before I hand over to, the mic to Max and Darren, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. First, today's webinar will be available on demand after the live session via the same link you're using now. We've also added um, a handy checklist that provides the seven steps you can take to protect, better protect your enterprise from DDoS threats. This is available through the attachments tab at the bottom of your screen. Next, we'd love to hear from you from, during today's presentation. If you have a question for us, please use the Ask a Question tab at the bottom of your player. We'll be answering questions at the end of the session. And if we don't get to your question, please do get in touch. And finally, I'd be really grateful if you could rate today's session using the voting, voting buttons on your screen. What we really wanted to do today was start off talking a little bit about the DDoS problem that's out there today, the kinds of DDoS attacks that we can expect to see, the different aspects of our infrastructure that are targeted by DDoS attacks, um, and really give you a kind of a bit of common background about, you know, what what the threat really entails. Then um, I'm going to take over from Mass, hopefully, and talk a little bit about some of the DDoS trends that we're seeing out there in the marketplace. What's going on, how DDoS is evolving, how we're seeing the scale of attacks, frequency of attacks, and complexity change over time. And then um, the plan is to hand back over to Mass to talk about um, the kinds of solutions that Orange Business Services can provide here and the best kinds of solutions for dealing with the DDoS threat. So uh, layered DDoS protection, hybrid DDoS protection, as it's called, as, as it's called by, um, by some. Okay, so um, setting the scene here. So d distributed denial of service attacks, as I'm sure you're all aware, um, are all about an attacker attempting to consume some or all of the resources that are assigned to a network service or application so that genuine users can't get through. And DDoS attacks are the primary threat to the availability pillar of the InfoSec triangle. Now, when people tend to think about DDoS attacks, they tend to think about the big high volume attacks that we tend to see in the media, the big bursts of traffic that are all about saturating um, our network connectivity so that um, uh, general traffic can't get through. Um, but that's actually only one type of DDoS attack. We call these volumetric DDoS attacks, and they're all about targeting network bandwidth. But we then have two other kinds of DDoS attacks. We have state exhaustion attacks, which are all about targeting the state tables in our firewalls, our load balancers, or our servers themselves. And we have application layer attacks, which are the more stealthy, more sophisticated attacks, which target our applications themselves. And those are the attacks that are a bit more difficult to detect, a bit more difficult to mitigate, because they use traffic which is much more like that of a, um, a genuine user. So different types of DDoS attacks target different aspects of our infrastructure in different ways, and they can have different kinds of impacts as well. For example, volumetric attacks fill up the pipe. If we can mitigate those attacks and the pipe opens up, things tend to start working again as normal. But with things like application layer attacks, it's much more important to mitigate them um, proactively, because if they do get through to our application infrastructure, then they can have a more long-lasting effect. Even after the attack is mitigated, we can be into long service recovery times and things like that. And this is why we tend to advocate something called layered DDoS defense, which I'll talk about a, bit later, um, a, a little bit later on. So um, threat agents and impact. So what's behind the DDoS uh, attacks that are going on out there today? Um, well, 
effectively, there's, there, there's a huge range of people that are launching DDoS um, attacks out there today. There's a huge um, uh, kind of underground sub-economy around services. So one of the key things I'm going to talk about in my section here today is the weaponization of DDoS, where there are lots of services out there that enable pretty much anybody to launch fairly sophisticated DDoS attacks against a target of their choice. So that's that, that, that one thing. So there's the cyber criminal aspect of DDoS attacks. There's the potential for inter-organization rivalry, where one organization targets another to get a competitive advantage. There's the nation state side of things. And then, of course, there's individuals. There's an awful lot of DDoS activity going on out there that is um, around gaming, people targeting others because of, uh, well, because of either they want to get an advantage over somebody in a game or because they perceive that they've been treated unfairly by a game of some description. So lots of reasons why different kinds of people launch DDoS attacks. Why? I've already talked to some of that. You know, there's the competitive advantage side of things. Ideological hacktivism, that was big a few years ago. We all saw Anonymous, we all saw Lulsec. Still going on out there, um, but generally in a more fragmented, more regionalized way. Ransom um, attacks, extortion attacks, these have um, come back into the headlines recently, been around for well over 10 years. But again, everyone's probably seen the media around DDoS for Bitcoins, around the Armada Collective and organizations like that, um, you know, using DDoS attacks to try and extort money from organizations by, by threatening the availability of their services unless they pay with a certain number of Bitcoins. And then one of the emerging motivations that we really see is smokescreen. And this is where DDoS attacks are used as a disguise for um, another kind of cybercrime um, to effectively distract a security team from the real purpose of an attacker. And that's something that's growing fairly quickly and something I'll talk about a bit more in my section um, as we move forward. Impact, again, is something that I'm going to cover a little bit, but one key thing that it's important to realize around DDoS attacks is that the, reven um, the impact can be both multidimensional and it can be fairly long-lived. People tend to think about the impact from a DDoS attack as being purely about the revenue that they may lose during the availability outage, um, but there are other issues around brand impact, operational costs, things like that. Max, I'll hand back over to you um, and you can pick up. Yeah, so we pretty much covered everything, uh, really. It's um, just just to finish this part is uh, you know we we will uh, we live in a digital transformation age and uh, and uh, uh, business is based on trust. So digital trust is everything nowadays in this digital age, and and it also is really aiming to disrupt this digital trust. So um, I, I now let's say pass back the microphone to you uh, for your uh, for your part. Thank you, Darren. So, um, hello again, everybody. Uh, this is Darren Anstey. Um, uh, what I'd like to do over the next 20 minutes or so is really share some of the latest research that Arbor has on the DDoS threat landscape. And having visibility into how threats are changing is hugely important as it allows us to assess our risk and put the right defenses in place based on um, our risks and our risk assessments. So hopefully you'll find a lot of the information that I'm going to present today useful. Um, and if there are questions that you have, if there is uh, more detail that you require, please don't hesitate to reach out to us, um, either within this webinar or after this webinar. You know, we have um, far more data than I'm going to be presenting here today. So if you have other questions, if you have you know, different aspects that you want me to drill down into, please do let us know. So what I'm going to be doing here today in, in, to, to, to outline DDoS trends is I'm going to be looking at two specific data sets. Firstly, I'm going to be using data from Arbor's 12th Annual Worldwide Infrastructure Security Report. The data within um, our Infrastructure Security Report primarily comes from a survey that we send out to the broader operational security community um, every October, and that's both enterprises and service providers. And the survey is all about gathering the collective experiences, observations, and concerns of the OPSEC community. And it's about finding out what threats people are most concerned about, what mitigation strategies they have, what's working, and of course, what isn't working. So when we pull all of this data together and build the report, it becomes a really useful repository of information about what's going on out there. And if you want a copy of the complete um, report, you can download it for free from the Arbor website. Um, but it is very long. It's well over 100 pages. So what I'm going to be delivering here today is a summary of some of the key findings from that report. The second data set that I'm going to talk to today, though, is data from Arbor's Atlas system. Now, Atlas gives Arbor a unique level of visibility into the internet threat landscape. 
over 350 of our service provider customers have um, opted to share data with us every hour on the DDoS attacks that they're seeing on their networks. And we can use that data to build up a picture of what's happening over time, how the DDoS threats um, are evolving, things like that. And we can drill down from global trends to look at what's going on regionally, all the way down to individual countries and things like that. And I'll be including some of this data in what I talk about here today um, so that we can add some more depth to the Worldwide Infrastructure Security Report, some more detailed um, kind of statistics, if you will, on what's actually going on at the technical level. So let's get started then. And before we go into um, real detail here, I wanted to kind of highlight some of the main trends that we're seeing um, from this year's Worldwide Infrastructure Security Report. As in previous reports, um, this is so. This is kind of a this is this is kind of a continuous thing that we're seeing at the moment. We've 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 seen the size, frequency, and complexity of attacks increase through 2016. What was different about 2016 was the rate of change. We've seen size, frequency, and complexity of attacks really take a jump upwards. Um, you know, there's been constant ac acceleration in these things since 2012, but there was huge gr growth in 2016. And that changes the level of risk for many businesses. Most businesses, small or large, now exist within a mesh of data and application services, and they're becoming increasingly dependent on those services for business continuity. More organizations are aware of this, they're aware of the DDoS threat, and they need protection from that threat. So it's important to understand what's going on. It's important to really know about how the threats are evolving so that we can make sure that we have the right defenses in place. So let's move on to look at the trends that we're seeing out there in a little bit more detail. So. We've all seen the media reports from last year about um, very, very large DDoS attacks of you know, over 500 gigabits per second in size, targeting Krebs, targeting Dyne, um, targeting the games in Rio, things like that. We all know that there are very large attacks going on out there, but we may not really appreciate how large some of these attacks have now become. The largest attack reported in 2016 by our survey respondents was over 800 gigabits per second. And that was a 60% jump from 2015's 500 gigabits per second. And as you can see from the graph on this slide, we've seen very rapid growth in peak attack sizes since about 2012. Things are going up very, very rapidly. And one of the key problems with the growth in attack scale is the ease with which an attacker can now saturate the internet connectivity of their target. And in fact, 41% of enterprise organizations that responded to our survey last year told us they'd seen a DDoS attack that completely saturated their internet connectivity. 61% of data center operators told us the same thing. So there are a lot of very large attacks going on out there that are causing real problems for people. And the key thing to realize is that these large attacks are no longer what we call black swan, attack, um, black swan events. They're, they're happening regularly now. If we go back three or four years, we'd only have expected to see a handful of attacks over 100 gigabits per second every year. This year, a third of our survey respondents told us that they'd seen attacks of over 100 gigabits per second, and that was up from a quarter the year before. And if we really want to understand how the numbers have changed, um, we can look at Atlas data, and that's what I'm going to do now. So as I mentioned, um, Atlas is collecting data from around 350 of our service provider customers. And last year, it monitored 558 attacks over 100 gigabits per second, 87 attacks over 200 gigabits per second. And that's massive increases from the 223 and the 16 that we saw in the previous year. And that 223 and 16 were massive jumps from what we'd seen in 2014. So there are very large attacks out there. There are very large numbers of these very large attacks going on out there today. And fundamentally, as you know, end user organizations, as data center operators, we need ISP services to deal with attacks of this magnitude. There isn't much we can do about very, very large high magnitude DDoS attacks at the edge of the internet, at, you know, where, where we connect in. So big attacks are becoming increasingly common, but more generally, I suppose, you know, average attack sizes, which are you know, just as important, are also shifting upwards. This year, or last year, I suppose, in 2016, 20% um, of the attacks that we tracked were over a gigabit per second, and that was up from 16% in 2015. An average attack size was also up 23% to just under one gig a second. 
And the one gigasecond threshold is really important because many enterprises have internet connectivity at or around this level. And the fact that we're seeing many more attacks at or around one gigabit per second means that there are many more attacks that can saturate the internet connectivity of a lot of enterprises. And to deal with this problem, they need services from a trusted ISP who knows how to deal with the high magnitude attacks, who has the technical capability of dealing with those high magnitude attacks. So what's driving DDoS attack scale? Well, historically, when we've talked about driving factors for attack scale, we've tended to focus on something called reflection amplification. And I'll talk about that in a bit more detail later on. It, it hasn't gone away, but it's kind of been subsumed by the hot topic of last year, which was Internet of Things botnets. So key thing to, um, to, 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 to be aware of is that IoT botnets are not that new. They've been around for a few years. They've been used for a number of um, well-publicized DDoS attacks um, you know, over the last three or four years or so. What changed last year, though, was that we started seeing mass recruitment of IoT devices by a broad range of attackers who've really kind of realized the capability here that they can exploit. And this is kind of similar to other things that we've seen happen um, in the DDoS world. So a few years ago, uh, many of you might be aware of a big storm of network time protocol reflection amplification attacks that happened across the Internet. That seemed to happen because uh, the media reported about uh, some successful attacks. They, they talked about how these attacks worked. And then, hey presto, we saw lots of attackers adopt, um, adopting this methodology. IoT seems to have gone the same way, especially given that the Mirai source code um, has now been shared and things like that. What's really key, though, with the IoT threat is the huge numbers of devices that are out there that can be exploited. I mean, there are estimates at the moment that, that, that range from 6 to 10 billion devices being out there today, and that's growing all the time. And, you know, as I mentioned, our personal and business worlds have become a mesh of device connectivity. By their very nature, these devices that we're deploying, you know, have to be easy to deploy and use. They have to require minimal configuration. But in many cases, that's meant that there's been minimal regard for security. People don't tend to think about IoT devices as small internet connected computers. Most don't consider whether you know, these things need firmware updates, whether they have default passwords, whether they have administration interfaces that are open to others talking to them. They don't consider them in this way. And you know, this is giving us the problem that we face today. And attackers are exploiting this capability. And we've all seen the results. You know, the attacks of north of 500 gigabits per second last year and of course you know the outages that came as a part of the dyne attack and things like that so possibly the best known um, iot um, malware is mirai um, so i want to look at that in just a little bit more detail before i move on so mirai is fundamentally designed to build and grow large botnets of compromised devices that's what it's all about a device that's infected with Mirai is capable of launching multiple different types of DDoS attacks, a whole, a whole gamut of different um, attack vectors, ranging from volumetric attacks to state exhaustion attacks, right the way through to application layer attacks. And an individual device can launch multiple attack vectors at the same time towards multiple targets, so it's quite sophisticated. But what the device will also do, whilst it's doing this potentially, is scan for other devices to actually try and compromise. So the botnet is kind of self-growing um, to an extent, which is quite clever. To really understand this in more detail, um, what we did in Arbor was um, deploy some honeypots out there to really understand what was happening with scanning and exploit activity so that we could get hold of you know, the malware that was being used and all of those kinds of things. One of the networks of honeypots that we do is purely dedicated to looking at the scanning activity, the compromise activity, and things like that. And over a two-week period, at the end of last year, um, one of our networks of honeypots saw over a million logins from 92,000 devices that were scanning them. So, you know, there's a lot of IoT scanning going on out there. And in APAC and LATAM, we were seeing more than one login attempt per minute to those honeypots. And what that really means is that if you put an undefended IoT device out there on the internet in one of those regions and it has a vulnerability, it won't stay um, clean for very long. It will be compromised very quickly. So there is a lot of capability out, of, out, out, out there for um, attackers to leverage. Now, obviously, we've seen the, you know, these very large attacks from, IOP, from IoT botnets, but it is also worth highlighting that you know, 
some of the attacks are truly, truly immense in scale. You know, we had some people in the Worldwide Infrastructure Security Report um, respondent group telling us about attacks that were north of like 500 million packets per second from a Mirai botnet. That's a huge amount of packets per second to deal with, um, you know, and you really need protection from someone like OBS, Orange Business Services, to deal with these kinds of attacks. You need the technical capability, you need the operational capability to deal with these high magnitude volumetric attacks. So IoT is one driver for DDoS scale. Another, as I mentioned, is our old friend reflection amplification. Um, didn't hit the media so much last year, but it is still out there. It is still a key problem. For those of you who aren't familiar with reflection amplification attacks, they're possible because of two unfortunate realities about the internet. The first is that there are a lot of poorly configured and poorly secured devices out there on the internet that are running a UDP service, where if you send that service a request, the response that it sends back will be larger than the request, in some cases many times larger. The second unfortunate reality is that it is relatively easy to fake the source IP address of traffic that you're sending into the internet from many service providers. This is called source address spoofing. When you combine these two things together, you effectively give people the ability to launch reflection amplification attacks. Um, and attackers can amplify the amount of traffic that they're able to direct at a target by tens or even hundreds of times. So this is where historically some of the really, really large volumetric DDoS attacks have come from. Now, there are a range of different UDP protocols and services that attackers can leverage for reflection amplification, and they do vary over time. It tends to be fairly cyclic as, you know, a, a different attack tools are circulated, different lists of good reflector IP addresses are circulated. But last year, DNS seems to have come back into fashion as the leading protocol being used for reflection amplification. Um, attacks. And in fact, by the end of last year, we were seeing around 18,500 attacks per week using DNS um, across the globe using Atlas data. And that's roughly, that's roughly double the number that we were seeing at the start of the year. So things like NTP, things like SSDP still being used out there. And we actually saw some cyclic trends in those last year as well. But DNS was the one that, that really stood out last year as the one that was becoming increasingly popular with the attacker community. What we also saw, though, from looking at this data and looking at what was going on with, with reflection amplification was peak attack sizes growing very fast. So largest attack we saw using reflection amplification last year up at nearly half a terabit. And in fact, we saw both DNS and NTP being used to generate attacks north of 400 gigabits per second. So attack scale is growing very quickly. It's driven by IoT, driven by reflection amplification. Um, you know, but we haven't, you know, but, but this is something that will continue to happen. So scale, scale is a key problem and scale is, is only going to get worse fundamentally. So now what I'd like to do is move on to talk a little bit about um, attack complexity. So as I mentioned at the start, not all DDoS attacks target our infrastructure in the same way. Um, when, you know, not everything aims to fill up the pipe. Some things target state tables, some things target our applications directly. If we look at the attack type breakouts for our service provider and enterprise respondents from the Worldwide Infrastructure Security Report, we can clearly see that volumetric attacks are the most common um, kinds of attacks that go on out there. They're very effective, very simple to generate. Um, you know, there's lots of tools, lots of botnets out there that can do this stuff. But although volumetric attacks do make up the majority of what's going on, the more sophisticated, um, the more stealthy application layer attacks, which are using traffic much more like that of a genuine user, as I mentioned, um, they are also growing. And growing proportions of our respondents are seeing these attacks. 95% saw them in 2016, up from 93% in 15, 90% in 2014. So the DDoS threat is not all about these big volumetric attacks. The stealthy attacks are a key problem that's out there today. What the uh, sharp eyed amongst you might have noticed is that the service providers and enterprises actually have different views around the proportions of application layer attacks that they actually see. And this is actually quite interesting because it kind of illustrates the different granularities of visibility that service providers and enterprises have of the traffic across the internet. Service providers have a much more macro view of what's going on, as you'd expect, and enterprises have a more focused view of their own traffic. This makes sense, after all. And this is a key reason 
why layered DDoS defense, something I'm going to talk about later on, um, it's a key reason why it's so important to deal with the DDoS threat. You need that more focused solution at the edge of the enterprise, at the edge of the data center, to deal with those more stealthy application layer attacks proactively before they can cause us a problem. But you also need an ISP-based service to deal with the high magnitude attacks, the high scale attacks that I've you know, already mentioned uh, you know, are increasing in frequency. And layered protection is also important to deal with what we call multi-vector attacks. And these are again something that's continuing to grow strongly. Multi-vector attacks, as their name would suggest, is simply when an attacker launches multiple different attack vectors at the same time toward the same target. In 2016, 67% of service providers told us they'd seen these attacks going on out there, up from 56% the year before, 32% in 2014. And these kinds of attacks are becoming um, increasingly common because of weaponization. Now, I mentioned that um, earlier on, but weaponization is all about this kind of the service industry that's grown up around DDoS. To launch a multi-vector attack, you used to really have to know what you were doing. But now you can do it with a single click of a button in one of these DDoS for hire, botnet for hire services that are actually out there. And the only way to really deal with these multi-vector attacks um, in a way that maintains service availability is with layered DDoS defense. And that's something that Orange Business Services can provide. So looking at the targets of application layer attacks, um, as you would expect, uh, DNS and HTTP um, are the two top services that are being hit out there. But we are seeing continued growth in the respondents um, to the Worldwide Infrastructure Security Survey that are seeing attacks targeting, encrypting, targeting encrypted web services, HTTPS services. The main problem with obviously DNS and HTTP being top is that you know DNS is the control plane for most of what we do on the internet, and HTTP and you know HTTPS are the protocols used by most of the services that we actually depend upon. So what these results really show us is that you know the attackers are really targeting what we use most, what would cause us the biggest headache. You know they're targeting us, the, they're targeting the applications and services that we really rely on from a business perspective. So from a complexity perspective, things are on the up, you know, largely driven, as I've already said, by the ongoing weaponization of DDoS. And this is actually also contributing to increasing attack frequencies. And this year, attack frequencies are up um, across the board. If we look at data from the Worldwide Infrastructure Security Report, if we look at data from Atlas, and anecdotally, when we talk to our customers, you know, we're getting a very consistent message. The number of attacks that are happening out there is growing very quickly. So, and you know, the numbers on this slide kind of speak for themselves. 53% of ISPs seeing more than 51 attacks per month. 45% of enterprises seeing more than 10, 10 attacks per month. 21% of data centers seeing more than 50 attacks per month. And you can see the growth rates here as well, the previous year's percentages. Things are jumping up very quickly, especially for enterprises and data centers. And you know, when you combine this with the increase in attack scale, the increase in attack complexity, this makes DDoS a big and potentially very expensive problem if the right solutions, services, people, and processes aren't in place. So what's motivating attackers to launch all of these attacks? Well, I talked a little bit about this um, earlier on, but there are a whole range of things that motivate attackers. But this year, the uh, top motivation that we're seeing behind the most attacks out there is actually gaming. Now, gaming tends to usually come top because there are so many people involved in the gaming world. Um, there are so many reasons why people get disgruntled about the gaming world, either because you know, you know, they want to get an advantage, they think someone's had an advantage over them. There's a whole range of things. And we do generally see the motivations move up and down quite a bit. But this year, actually, um, gaming uh, took a really big spike upwards. And 63% of our service provider respondents told us that they, were, that, that they were seeing gaming as a common or very common motivation behind attacks. And that was a jump from 41% the year before. So, you know, this is kind of indicative of the world that we live in. It's indicative of the fact that people do take this stuff really seriously. It's very important to people's lives, in some cases, online gaming. But there are obviously a lot of other motivations. So again, I mentioned that ideological hacktivism has seen a return to prominence this year in what's going on out there. We're not back where we were four or five years ago when we were seeing the global protests from you know, anonymous, lulsec, people like that. 
But we are seeing more regionalized ideological activism. Wherever there's a uh, geopolitical dispute, wherever there's an election, wherever there's a big issue being debated, we tend to see DDoS attacks following on in the cyber world. So you, you kind of see echoes in cyberspace of what's going on in the real world um, you know, from the ideologically motivated attacks. Extortion is also something that's come back into focus. Again, around the DDoS for Bitcoins, Armada Collective side of things. Extortion's been around in DDoS for an awfully long time, originally targeting gaming and gambling organizations. Over the last couple of years or so, we've seen a lot of financials, a lot of media organizations being targeted by extortion-based DDoS campaigns. Sometimes you're targeted with a note that says, pay us this or we'll target you, and nothing happens. Other times, something does happen. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to tell um, up front in many cases. What is interesting here, though, um, around the motivation side of things, is the big increase that we saw this year in um, enterprises, seeing DDoS being used for, um, or being used as a disguise for other kinds of cybercrime. This has been talked about in a lot of reports for the last two or three years. But what we've seen this year is a really big jump in the proportion of enterprises seeing this. So 26% of, respond of, of our respondents this year, enterprise respondents, told us that they were seeing DDoS attacks being used to disguise other forms of cybercrime, up from 12% um, the year before. And what we're really seeing is attackers adopting what we call a combined arms message, a, a combined, combined arms approach to achieving their goal. And this really emphasizes how important it is to have services and solutions in place that can effectively deal with each aspect of an overall attack. So if an attacker is trying to steal data from us and they're using a DDoS attack to be able to, to, to try and disguise that data theft, we need to be able to deal with that DDoS attack very efficiently, very effectively, so that we're not pulling resources around because that's fundamentally what the attacker wants us to do. They want us to change our, our, our normal mode of operation so that what they're really trying to, 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 to do goes unnoticed so that they really can achieve their goal. So it's really important to be able to deal with things like DDoS as effectively and as efficiently as possible using the right services, solutions, and technologies so that we don't have to move things around during a potentially very stressful period. So we've talked a little bit about the scale, complexity, and frequency of attacks, but who's actually being targeted by the DDoS attacks that are going on out there? Well, the top target verticals, according to service providers, are government, finance, and hosting organizations. Um, and you know that kind of tallies with what we're hearing from the enterprises themselves as well. But if you look at the responses from the enterprises, you actually get a better picture, a more granular picture of what proportions of different verticals are being hit. So for example, if we look at all of our enterprise respondents, 42% of them told us they'd seen a DDoS attack last year. But that was the overall number. For finance organizations, we were up at 63%. For government organizations, 53%. So in some verticals, the chances of being attacked are actually better than one in two now. You know, that's a pretty high chance of being attacked, a pretty significant risk. It really means that we need the right defenses in place. And finance, government, hosting, gaming, e-commerce services, they all have a lot to lose from a successful DDoS attack. And there is an increase that, you know, that, that there, there is an increased appreciation out there of, of the overall business impact of a successful attack. So what are the impacts seen by um, our enterprise respondents this year? Well, reputation and brand damage were the top impacts, you know, as you might expect. But it's interesting to see that there were two things at the top here. Because a few years ago, when we, we, if you asked an enterprise about the kinds of impact they would expect to see from a successful DDoS attack, it would have been um, squarely revenue loss. And that's probably all that, all, all that you would have got back in terms of an answer. But what's really changed is that as people have become more aware of the DDoS threat, as, as they've got more experience of the DDoS threat, as they've started to see what's going on with their competitors and with others out there that have been attacked before, they're beginning to appreciate that the impact of a successful attack can be multidimensional, can be much more longer lived. And in fact, over two thirds of our enterprise respondents now factor DDoS into their business or IT risk management processes. And that's really positive news because the fact that they're doing that means that they're start to considering it alongside, starting to consider it alongside other risks. And that means that you know, they should be able to get the right kind of focus, the right kind of levels of investment into the right protective services and solutions.
And that kind of brings me on to um, the best way to deal with DDoS attacks. So DDoS attacks are continuing to evolve all the time, but DDoS is a well understood threat and defenses are available that can successfully counter that threat. And the best defenses for the DDoS threat are what we call layered or hybrid defenses. And these are acknowledged as the best practice by pretty much every analyst out there. And the only reason we call it layered or hybrid is because different analyst firms tend to, tend to use slightly different nomenclature. So layered DDoS defense is all about a combination of an on-premise enterprise or data center edge solution that can proactively deal with all kinds of DDoS attacks, stop them before they cause an impact to our services. However, these on-premise solutions can't deal with high magnitude attacks because if our internet connectivity is saturated, there's not much we can do. So that on-premise component has to be paired with an ISP-based service that can deal with these higher magnitude attacks, that has the capacity and the technical ability to filter out these huge volumetric attacks so that um, you know, our services can continue um, you know, in, 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 and work normally. And ideally, these two layers need to be integrated together. They need to be working together so that the on-premise component can provide us with that complete protection, but it can then call for help automatically from an ISP as it detects an attack escalate so that the ISP can take over and deal with that attack for us. Now, Arbor provides market-leading technologies in this area. We have solutions for the service provider, solutions for the enterprise and the data center. But to really get protection from the DDoS threat, we also need people, process, and services to address the problem. And this is where organizations like Orange Business Services come in. They have the experience, they have the technical know-how, they have the ability to offer services that can really give enterprise and data center organizations complete protection from the DDoS threat. So that's pretty much um, all I wanted to talk through here today. And at this point, um, I'll hand back over to Matt. Thank you, Darling. I hope that everyone can, <clears throat> can hear me well now. So really interesting information. Thank you. And I strongly agree with you that uh, the DOS problem needs to be addressed with a risk management approach, given that it carries with itself uh, direct impact and uh, also indirect uh, impact. So, let me briefly now uh, go through how Orange is helping uh, customers to address this uh, challenge. So Orange Cyber Defense is the business unit dedicated to cyber security and uh, has developed uh, together with uh, market leaders such as Arbor Networks, a multi-layered solution uh, aiming at protecting the three weak points that DDoS attack uh, leverage on, as we've seen in the previous slide. So Orange, on top of this solution, also built an end-to-end pro end -end process uh, to help customers to, to detect and remediate from this uh, type of attack. As you said, process is very important to, to contain the, the remediation time because time we've seen those attack, time costs money. Um, at, at the end, I want to say that the, the DOS layer is uh, supported by traditional uh, by additional threat intelligence that help to anticipate uh, some of those attacks. So, and we we'll see better in the next slide what what uh, what is all about. So, uh, what we see here, um, uh, it's 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 what is called cyber sock. So, uh, the precise mechanisms of the just attack are constantly changing. Without this type of intelligence, it's difficult to keep it up, right? So, the ARM cyber sock is an ecosystem blending people, processes, and technologies, which is built around different cyber defense solutions. And, as, and such as the DOS uh, protection one that we see here. So um, the CyberSOC is it, this ecosystem that including different solutions, as I said, not only the DOS, but other ones. Now the focus today obviously is the DOS. So what, what we have uh, here is uh, an infrastructure layer that the infrastructure needs to be monitored. We've seen uh, the different components, the internet pipe, the security perimeter with stateful devices and the backend uh, web application servers. Um, then we have a uh, technology layer, so specialist vendor technology layer, such as Arbor Network, and Orange has deployed Arbor Network technology to build a, a, scrubbing, a dedicated scrubbing center and on, on an internet backbone. Then we have a process layer, where we have cybersecurity specialists that take alerts generated automatically by the, by the technology layer, and they further investigate, qualify this, uh, this alert, and then potentially trigger the remediation action. So 
they really also act as an interface to, to the customer with, the, with the regular reporting and status on the current attack, um, ongoing attack and incident. So all this is complemented with actionable information produced by the threat intelligence units that we see here on the right-hand side. And, and we have uh, a third team, which is um, a team of specialists that monitor public sources, such as the clear internet, the dark internet. They monitor for relevant information about malicious activity against a specific target, such as phishing campaigns. They monitor for actor promoting DDoS campaign and trading cyber weapon on the underground forums. All this information is collected, um, qualified, and transformed in actionable information. Then we have uh, an epidemiology component, which is uh, uh, a facility that captures artifacts on the internet, uh, orange internet backbone, such as malware and cyber weapons, and then uh, it detonates them in a physical sandbox, understanding inbound signal, outbound signal, and if it's necessary, can dissect this malware with reverse engineering techniques. This uh, lab produces indicators of compromise that are injected in the threat intelligence database you see below. The threat uh, intelligence database, it's, it's, a, it's an automatic tool that is uh, updated in real time uh, from 400 plus sources, from other certs and other uh, sources from, uh, from uh, security databases, and also from the indicator of compromise generated by the CERT and the epidemiology lab. So this threat intelligence database injects enriched information in the detec in detection layer. Uh, and this really results in a superior de detection capability. In some of the cases, analyzing this weak signal on the orange internet backbone, we are able to understand that, is, that there's some, probably some common and controlled uh, signal that start instructing botnets to, to prepare for an attack. So in such cases, we are able to raise the radar and be ready for a potential attack. Now, um, let's uh, um, focus uh, a bit more in detail on, on, the, on the DDoS protection solution itself. So um, we have two main components here, the clean, one called clean pipe and the other called side guardian. Clean pipe is a protection against the volumetric attacks where the internet traffic is redirected to uh, a scrubbing center. Okay? The, the redirected traffic is clean of the back traffic and only the good traffic is sent back to the customer data center of facilities. Now we see here two scrubbing centers. Uh, they can be used seamlessly by the CyberSOC. So the important point is that CyberSOC implement a seamless service and process regardless of the underlying infrastructure. Okay. And uh, this is important, as you said, the process is important to, to keep the reaction time low and um, to provide the customer with, uh, with a guarantee service. Uh, <clears throat> and more in particular, the, the Orange Cubby Center is engaged when the customer is uh, leveraging on Orange Internet uh, backbone access, and the Arbor Scrubbing Center is engaged when customer leverage on third-party ISP. So this gives really freedom to customer to select whatever uh, technology connectivity layer they want. Um, on the other side, we have the Site Guardian. Uh, site Guardian complements the solution by protecting the, the other two types of DDoS attack, the um, state exhaustion attack that is targeting the stateful devices uh, of the perimeter of our uh, internet access, uh, such as firewall, intrusion detection, load balancer. As we've seen, these devices need to keep, keep a state table in order to enforce uh, security policies. And this state table is really the weak point uh, because it can be completely swamped by, by carefully crafted traffic. And the other protection offered by the site guardian is, um, is protecting the, uh, layers, uh, the layer 7 application that sits in the core network. So the site guardian is uh, basically an appliance from Arbor that is a, is a stateless appliance and is able to protect these two types of, uh, of attacks just mentioned. It can also partially protect volumetric attack, but not completely because it sits downstream of the internet pipe. So if the internet pipe is, uh, is completely uh, full, uh, the whole internet facility is, uh, is down. What the site guardian can do though is to detect this volumetric attack in real time and signal the cloud for triggering a, a, um, a volumetric protection. So the combination of two solutions is really providing uh, 360 degree protection, okay? 
So um, now, uh, Orange addressed the DDoS threat with, with the risk management approach by building an appropriate defense strategy according to the customer context. We want to, cyber, cyber security is synonymous of, of context. So we need to build this uh, cyber defense together with the customer, understand the digital asset and, and the type of business. We want to avoid uh, costly overprotected uh, uh, solution or risking underprotecting solution. Okay. So we, we have um, a consistent and standardized process to detect, remediate, analyze incidents. This is triggering this uh, continuous life cycle that uh, security um, needs to have nowadays to be, in a, to be positioned at a mature level. So you cannot take really a build and forget approach with DDoS protection. Uh, we've seen DDoS threats are involved. You explained very well that they are keeping, they are in a continuous evolution and, and they keep shifting and it can also be in the smoke screen. So you need really a superior capability to detect the DDoS, but also put them in context of a bigger picture. So um, um, we need to see this as a, as a sort of insurance. We have, we, we've heard from you, Darren, that a quarter of the DDoS tax uh, cost companies out $100,000, and many runs into million dollars. And then also we have the post-incident uh, uh, analysis, because we are not sure the DDoS were, were just alone uh, as a tap, but may be used as a, as a smoke screen to plant backdoor and use an APT attack. So we also have a in, further investigation. And this is a big impact on the company. So for us, the DDoS protection is really like an insurance policy. You, you, you need to insure what you cannot afford to lose. Um, now, I've been quick uh, to leave some, some time for question and then uh, hand back uh, the microphone to you, Helen. Thank, thank you, Max, and thanks to, to Darren as well. Um, we've got some time left for questions, um, but, but before we get to that, I'd just like to thank our audience for, for your time and invite you to download the, the checklist summarizing some of, some of the key points we've discussed today using the attachments tab. Um, we'll, we'll also email this through to you. To you. And there's also a link to, to some blog posts um, about the kind of latest DDoS um, trends we're seeing and, and other issues like, like, the, like the dark web. And um, finally, you know, please, please do um, you know, rate this session by, by using the voting um, stars and on your screen. It, it helps us ensure our content is as relevant as possible to you. Um, now, now to the questions. Um, let me let me see. Um, we, we've had a, f a few people asking um, Max if, if you could talk us through an example of a, a customer, an enterprise who's experienced a DDoS attack. You know, how quickly were they able to recover? You know, what was what was the impact? Yes. Okay, that's a good question. So, uh, when so the, the the automatic technology detect. Uh, uh, let's say uh, some some bad signals. This uh, raising an alert. The the analyst team picks this up and and start qualify this this alert. If they identify a real incident, they can trigger the remediation process. So from remedi remediation, uh, sorry, from remediation triggering to complete remediation, the process is about five minutes for a customer on Orange uh, Internet Backbone. The qualification process is taking about 15 minutes. Okay. The qualification process consists of either uh, just qualification and automatically triggering the response or consulting the customer for, to get authorization and to push the button for remediation. Um, then we have, as I said, the, the, the remediation will take about uh, up to five minutes. Uh, and this consists of really redirecting the, the BGP routing advertisement towards the, the Orange Scrubbing Center that will clean the traffic and send back the, the, the traffic uh, to, to the place. Uh, we, if, if the customer is an Orange yes, um, Internet backbone, we can mitigate uh, up to slash 32 uh, IP addresses or host level. If we are on third party, we need the slash 24 uh, uh, range of IP to protect or to direct, to redirect. And we also used, uh, and this is what concern um, uh, standard services. So if, if in case we have a sudden DDoS campaign like, like last year happened for uh, DDoS4BT, so DDoS for Bitcoin campaign, where we had uh, uh, um, uh, a gang of cyber criminal 
um, that were sending ransom uh, message to financial institution and and uh, and quickly run DDoS attack to prove their capabilities and asking for for money uh, through Bitcoin payment. So in that case, we had some uh, uh, urgent requests from some of the customers and that were not under DDoS protection. And we were able, because they were on the, on the orange backbone, we were able to mitigate in an emergency mode this type of, uh, of situation, what we call the red button. This is something we normally don't do, let's say, on a regular basis or in an emergency, but that, that uh, was uh, that is the kind of capability that Orange has if the customer is on an orange backbone. Great. Um, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Max. Um, Darren, we, we've had some other, other questions through on the the IoT um, threat threat landscape. You know, this is a, a very topical issue. How do we deal with the new risks that that this presents? Okay. So the IoT side of things is an interesting one. Um, as, you, as you say, it is a very hot topic at the moment. I mean, um, one one key thing to think about here is that you know what what we're kind of seeing is well, is large numbers of um, of devices that are very poorly secured being used to, you know, uh, being used to target us in a variety of different ways. So this is actually quite similar to where we were, you know, in the early noughties with kind of home PCs and things like that. So what we're seeing is a, is, is, is a kind of the same thing come around again, but in a slightly different way and with much larger number of devices. So there's kind of two things that we need to, 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 to kind of think about around the IoT problem. The first is dealing with the threats that are there now. So the IoT botnets that are out there are predominantly at the moment being used for DDoS attacks. We need to have the right defenses in place to deal with those DDoS attacks. As I mentioned um, when I was talking earlier on, many organizations are now reliant on the connected world for day-to-day -day business continuity. That means they're reliant on the availability of their data and application services. So they need the right DDoS defenses in place to counter the attacks that are coming out of these IoT botnets. Um, there are other things, though, that we're starting to see IoT botnets being used for, things like uh, proxying, things like trying to brute force passwords, and a variety of other things. But that's kind of slightly out of scope for this here today. But the, the, the first key thing is deal with the attacks that are coming from the botnets that exist now, which is predominantly DDoS. The second thing that we need to do is try and not become a part of the problem ourselves. Now, we've all heard about, you know, the issues that exist with IoT botnets in terms of, or with IoT devices in terms of poor security. So default passwords, open management interfaces, services that are running on them that um, don't need to be there, uh, unpatched operating systems with known vulnerabilities, all of these different kinds of things. But we can actually counter a lot of this with basic internet hygiene change passwords, make sure that these devices can only reach the internet if they really need to reach the internet, segment our internal infrastructure so that these devices are not on the same networks as our critical services, make sure that we monitor the networks that they are on so that we can tell what these devices are actually doing and can react um, appropriately if we start seeing them doing things that they, you know, that they shouldn't be doing. So, you know, there's, there's that aspect of it as well. We need to both counter the threats that are being targeted at us from the IoT botnet, but we also also need to be thinking about how we prevent our IoT devices being subsumed into those botnets. Great, um, thanks very much. Um, we've we've um, we've had another another few questions. Let me see. Um, um, this is perhaps one for, for Max. Is there a general difference in the level of DDoS protection on pure internet services offered by global providers like like Orange versus local ISPs? ISP, local ISPs can, uh, in fact, uh, protect from volumetric DDoS attacks. Um, now, they, they are limited in terms of uh, geographical coverage, but um, and, and, and in terms of visibility of what is going on on the internet backbone. So Orange is a global internet backbone, as I said, uh, is a great source of threat intelligence for us in order to uh, anticipate and stay ahead of the game. So I would say that the pure scale of the, the coverage it makes the difference uh, there. And another thing I want to add is that Orange has this unique uh, agreement with the Harbor where we have this uh, uh, seamless process where the CyberSoc can drive seamlessly the Orange infrastructure or the Harbor cloud infrastructure. And this is an important uh, point for, for from the customer's experience point of view. 
great. So, so you get that consistency of, of, of service around the world regardless of the underlying connectivity. Correct. Excellent. Um, so I've got another, another question here around um, the scrubbing centers. Um, does, does a clean pipe um, service, a scrubbing center service, slow down the internet traffic for customers? Yeah, okay, that's a very good question. In fact, by redirecting the traffic to the scrubbing center and then back to the customer, we, we inject an additional hop in the, in the internet traffic. Yes, it's, uh, it's slower in the sense that uh, we introduce a latency, for sure, but again, it needs to be weighted against the risk of not being online at all. So uh, it's, it's a mitigation that uh, it's, you know, most, most of the cases are necessary <laughs> to take uh, to do it because um, the other alternatives have not uh, been uh, online at all. And we've had a question here around the, the cyber cyber sock. Is is this a, a managed service? Um, you know, and, and you know, what's the the pricing model from 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 infrastructure to 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 servicing? Is is there a a benefit from from using um, Orange? Yeah, the cyber SOC is uh, yes, it is a managed service. It can work. Um, um, it, it really depends. We need we need to first of all assess the customer context. In the case of DDoS, we want to understand how many internet uh, uh, access we need to protect and what is the volume. So in terms of pricing model for DDoS, is is very the number of uh, internet access and 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 the bandwidth we want the protection for the volumetric part. For the for the site guardian part, it's again how many internet access capacity and of course the number of appliances will dictate the the pricing model. So the pricing. Um, if the service is available only on Orange ISP, um, no, it's 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 also possible to de deliver this service uh, on a third party internet connection. Uh, again, leverage on, on the on-premises appliance and combine with the Arbor Scrubbing Center, still driven by the CyberSoc uh, incident response process. Thank you. Great. Um, well, I, th I think we're just about out of time. Um, Darren and, and Max, I'd just like to thank you for your really interesting insights. And thanks again to our audience for your time. And we'd love to continue the conversation, so, so please do get in touch. Okay, thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, everyone.